as I said, it's not very sexy in a security sense. It's not a sexy profession, uh, which is why it's still more or less uh, hidden. Um, it's a, a yeah, invisible foundation uh, in governance. Um, but it's, it's, I think it, it is. I everything. think it's subtle sexy, Andre. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> the subtle sexy. Yes. <laughs> You should write an article about that. <laughs> I think, the section you know, of the I, am. I, I think our second episode ever, I think I titled it something like getting into the sexy world of I am or something like that. <laughs> so I just, it sprang into my mind when you said that. I was like, all right, I think I remember like five years ago writing a show title like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I try to get people to understand that I am can be sexy. So we're talking about zero trust and policy-based access control and all that new modern stuff, which makes, really makes it sexy. So yeah. there, are, there's new developments that that really help to uh, getting more into oh. the So that's the uh, it will help. It will grow. <laughs> well, if we if we didn't have to worry about DRM, I would play the uh, right said Fred. I'm too sexy for, and then you know fade out. So maybe that's what I'll do for this one. This is identity at the center. If it has anything to do with IAM, this is the go-to podcast. Now your hosts, Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity of the Center podcast. I'm Jeff and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Oh, not so bad yourself? Doing great. So I've been thinking a lot about training and professional development lately and um, I think really there's a couple of things, right? One is training and development for people who are just entering the industry. There are a few really good resources out there. Andrew Chanthone with his YouTube channel, David Lee with what he's doing on LinkedIn. I think those are fantastic outlets. There's a lot of kind of 101 level uh, information out there. Obviously for the more advanced learner, uh, one website that I've become familiar with recently is uh, Pluralsight. So Pluralsight has a lot of information. This is not an advertisement for Pluralsight, but has a lot of good <laughs> courseware and preparation materials for certifications. Now, I can't say from personal experience that they will properly prepare you, but it's at least a starting point. Um, and then, of course, YouTube has a ton of great content. Uh, and obviously, if you're linked in with any partners, usually, or with technology vendors, they have partner portals that have a lot of great information. And don't forget, probably the best two for everybody is the Identity Center podcast, of course, <laughs> Wealth of Knowledge, and the ID Pro Body of Knowledge. And I think we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Yeah, so uh, I guess uh, free commercial there for Pluralsight. Uh, Pluralsight, you want to sponsor? Hit me up. <laughs> um, yeah, I I used Pluralsight to actually pass an AWS certification late last year. So um, yeah, obviously that in conjunction with other things. But yeah, uh, always always be sharpening uh, the saw, as Jim likes to say. Lots of good resources out there. Um, yeah, I got nothing else to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think uh, that you've been you've been a fan of what Andrew's doing for quite a while. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he's I just saw LinkedIn. The show. He's, he's doing some stuff on LinkedIn again. So kudos to him. That's pretty cool to to get on LinkedIn learning again. Uh, I saw yeah. a picture, I think, with him in front of like a green screen or something like that, which is which is very neat. So congrats to Andrew uh, yeah. on that. Uh, another another LinkedIn learning class. So starting to rack him yeah. up, man. <laughs> <laughs> So we got some conferences that are coming up here in the next uh, really couple of weeks. Time is running out. Senecate, you and I are going to be there, Jim. We are working on a uh, exciting uh, show that we're going to be putting on this on the main stage. Uh, I'm not spoiling yet what we're going to be doing, but there is a survey that has gone out to people, and so I plead with people to answer the questions that they might have received from the FIDO Alliance uh, for the FIDO Authenticate Conference coming up here in a couple of weeks. It's October 14th to the 16th in Carlsbad, California. We have a discount code. Better, you better, <laughs> better got it because it's coming up. IDAC15 gets 15% uh, off of your registration. So we hope to see a lot of people there. And thanks to those who have already used the code that shows support for the show. It doesn't cost you anything. Doesn't doesn't cost anything, but shows support that we can you know drive folks to attend. Um, but again, I will plead, if you've gotten an email from Fido, there is a link to a survey. It asks you some questions. Please fill it out. 
we are going to be using it. That is an identity to center thing that we're going to be doing with the Fido Alliance uh, as part of uh, sort of opening ceremonies and kind of things that are be happening that day. So yeah, we'll also be podcasting there, Jeff. So we're going mm-hmm. to have a little uh, side. I don't know. I don't want to call it. A we'll booth. be somewhere. <laughs> we're going to be somewhere. So yeah. we're going to record a few episodes. So folks who are in attendance can kind of see the show as we do it live. Yeah. I think the plan right now is we'd be somewhere in like the expo hall area. It's a little more visible maybe than kind of last year. We were kind of stuck in a, in a back corner, which is great for like sound quality, but it was very difficult I think, for people to kind of find. Uh, but we should be, hopefully we will be around somewhere podcasting. So feel free to come up, watch, listen, and, you know, get a, an official fist bump of gratitude from, from Wa. Uh, yeah. let's see the week after that, Jim, we're going from California all the way to Florida. <laughs> We're going to be at the Sail Point Navigate Conference. This is kind of a late breaking one, but we actually have a discount code for that we just got. So if you use the code IDAC and you're planning on attending Sail Point Navigate October 21st to the 24th in Orlando, Florida, they get you $400 off. That's another one that's coming up here pretty pretty quickly in the next couple of weeks. So definitely want to on that. But that's another one, Jim, you and I are planning on doing uh, some recording at that episode or that conference, I should say. Uh, and I yeah. think I'm, I'm doing some sort of... Uh, presentation with uh our friend chad from rsm is rsm is a sponsor there and they are our employers so one of the benefits is yeah they get to bring us along and expand the word <laughs> yeah and we'll be in the land of the mouse which i think is cool um yeah i mean i like orlando jeff i remember being there with you in january in 70 <laughs> degrees i like oh my god i'm so hot it was seven, oh, it, oh come on, be fair to me, man. It was seven degrees, but like eighty five percent humidity. It's gross. It was pretty <laughs> muggy. It was pretty muggy. But you know, if you travel from the the great uh, the winterous north, uh, it feels good to get a break from that. Uh, I disagree. I would rather be cold than hot and humid. But that's just me. What can I say? I'm a strange bird. But I am <laughs> looking forward to be in Orlando. I'm looking forward to be indoors in Orlando in that sweet, sweet air conditioning. <laughs> so I stay nice and cool and dry, uh, but I'm sure I'll still be sweating because it's still Florida. Yeah. And maybe we can find our friend of the show, Sean O'Dell, Sean O'Dennity. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know he's an Orlando resident as well. So shout out to Sean. Yeah. And we're looking to get him back on the show. We're going to give kind of an update, I think maybe on like Cape and SSF and some things in the future. So uh, that'll be coming up here. We're kind of working on logistics on that. So yeah, we're going yeah, to get Sean and Anatole back on the on the show. Yeah, it's getting really hot. Um, and I'm not talking about the Orlando weather. I'm talking about uh, the whole shared signals framework. Yeah, so hot right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, why don't we talk uh, identity today? Um, we've got the business case for identity and access management. So uh, there was an article that we found on the ID Pro website, and Jim, you and I are members, as well as the author of that, Andre Coates. He's the author of The Business Case for IM. We'll have a link in our show notes to, for people to check that out. But welcome to the show, Andre. Thank you, Jim. Yes. I, uh, glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for taking the time. You're joining us from the Netherlands. So it's, uh, let's see, uh, local time for me right now is 10.52 a.m. What time is it in the Netherlands? What's well, uh, 10 to five in the afternoon. Okay. So ready to uh, do data later on after the show. <laughs> well, always leave on a high note. So that's probably a good thing, right? You're on the podcast here with us. First time you've been on the show. So tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you get into the world of identity and access management? Did you choose it or did it choose you? It, it didn't exist when I started. So this, I've been in identity access management for 25 years and I came from the security and you could say, and before that, uh, I, my training started as a financial accountant uh, for the tax department doing fraud investigations. Well, and uh, later on, I learned fraud is, of course, abuse of authorizations. So you could say from from the school, I've been working authorization management. So it didn't exist as a profession. Uh, it's a new profession. And I, I, well, I got into it um, in the Twitch some 25 years ago when it's still very much IT oriented, much more about uh, get, making accounts, creating accounts. and Later on, uh, the identity stuff came to it. So I've been there for quite a long time. Uh, first, as an internal employee in staff for tax department and some insurance companies. And later, as a consultant uh, working in identity access management. So that's my uh, background a little. Um, three and a half years ago, four, almost four years ago, in the midst of Corona, I started my own company with two friends. 
uh, and it's called Solid B. And we decided to specialize in I didn't check certain image, but within IAM, we specialized in business consultancy. So we stay away from technology. That's the yeah. easy part. And that's why I, I uh, well, we we've got some interesting uh, use case for customers. And, and that's where also this article came from. So I couldn't explain some more about that, but that's where the article came from. Every customer wants to know why should I do anything in IAM? And what does God's was it bring? So, uh, in fact, this article and the other articles I wrote for, uh, for ID Pro um, came from the well, my practice experience as a consultant, helping customers and trying to share the knowledge we have. So that's to my background a little. Um, let me dive into it a little more. I joined ID Pro always from the start, mm-hmm. and um, uh, then I know we learned about the. Uh, ID Pro mission, for instance, sharing knowledge. Uh, the body knowledge that came to exist, and I joined the body knowledge committee from the start. And uh, so I've been there four years now. I'm not sure. Heather will know. Uh, so uh, I've been to the, in the body knowledge committee, writing articles, reviewing articles, helping set up this, uh, the direction of the body knowledge. And that's where we now. Well, we're all about sharing the knowledge. So that is great. And thank you for contributing right to the domain of identity with this type of stuff. This, so I think this is the perfect time to have you on the show because we just released an episode that kind of talked about uh, building up an IAM program. What does it take to start an IAM program? And one of those things was getting stakeholder buy-in. And it's very difficult to get stakeholder buy-in <laughs> without a business case, right? Because they're going to ask, okay, well, what do I, what's in it for me or my organization or what do I get out of it? So I'm really glad that you're on the show. So, you know, thanks for setting the time aside the time for us. I like joining and uh, I just want to say this is a relevant topic. And most of the times when we start at customers for any project, it starts at the IT department. Most IEM projects or issues are IT related, are uh, assumed to be IT related problems. And, uh, well, we of course we know it's not. It's always business oriented. So when the IT people start an IEM project, they need to have a business case. They need to have funding for that. And this is why these article came from. We need to find the ways to help IT or business understand why, what are the costs and the benefits of doing IEM or not doing IEM. Uh, so it's it's uh, come from our mission for the company as well. We try to do business consultancy. We should help businesses understand the need for identity, especially access management, governance, in the broad sense. So, yes, I can uh, relate to what you said, uh, Jeff. So, Andre, you're making a strong case around that this IM is, is about business. So, what makes a good business case for identity access management investments? This is the, the hardest question you could say, you could ask you, Jim. So, <laughs> What's a good business case? Uh, in the article, we try to find. I try to find a few viewpoints to look at uh, investment needs for investment and possibilities. And um, the most important viewpoint, in my perspective, is not just looking at a financial business case. So, what does it cost? What does it bring? What's the return of investment? That's that should be simple to do, uh, but it's very hard in IEM. There's a the second uh, part. Let's say not the non-financial business case. It's about what does IAM bring you from a risk management and governance compliance perspective, from an end user perspective. And these are perhaps non quantifiable. You cannot, well, I say calculate the money that that cost or brings. Whereas for a financial business case, you could, of course, try to calculate the cost of investment, the cost of support, implementation, the cost of training, whatever. But from a, the non financial point of view, Costs are more difficult. It's mostly non-financial, as I said. So the, the, the well, I said the disadvantage of doing IEM from a non-financial perspective are mostly like culture, like getting used to new ways of working, and losing a victim, <laughs> losing uh, ways to blame people because you're automa- automating stuff that's being done manually. You can also blame someone who did it wrong. But in, in automating doing IEM, you try to automate it. You're losing that blaming perspective. So there's a different way of looking at it. So if you're doing a good business case, you have to look both at the financial business case. So what does it cost? What does it bring? We get into that later, I guess, in more depth. But you know, should also look at what does it cost me, my organization, to 
invest in IAM, what does it bring? Not from a financial perspective. So do we get more better governance? I'm more compliant, uh, laws and regulations, such that makes it easier. How about use convenience, which is also hard to calculate? Um, so there's a lot of things you have to look at for a good business case. So a bad business case, in my opinion, it's, it's only about cost. If you just say, well, a tool like an identity conversation tool, it will cost one million and it doesn't bring any money. Well, that's a lousy business case. Um, so I, I, I try to make uh, fun of this, but a big fancy business case. You will not make money of IEM unless you're a vendor or consultant. So business is making a business case, financial business case. Try you. You better. You will not make um, money. You can don't get profit by investing in IEM. Perhaps may get a lot of financial benefits, so don't return in profits. But that's the same if you're investing in an ERP system, for instance, or a CRM system. You will invest a lot of money in an ERP system. It will not give any profit. And but that's for IEM. It feels differently. It feels not the same. Investing in ERP, you have to because you, your business continuity depends on it. But with IAM, there's hardly any business need or hardly any need. You will not uh, go bankrupt if you don't do IAM. So that's difficult to say. So it's a, a good business case. It should look at the investments in IAM, both from a financial perspective and from a non-financial perspective. Now, in the article, I say quantitative versus qualitative. Qualitative meaning you can calculate uh, the costs and the benefits. And qualitative, no calculation at all. It's just uh, go for it. Believe in it. It feels good. <laughs> so, so good yes. <laughs> yeah, well, I, oh, the, there was a lot that you said there, Andre, and you know, I want to unpack a few things. So you talked about um, the, the risk reduction versus... Uh, okay, you're not going to make money off of IAM unless you're a vendor. Um, I kind of feel like there's a difference for the workforce IAM investments versus customer IAM investments, where I do think they can be at least part of um, driving the business revenue, right? You can make a business case that, hey, customer IAM is an enabler of doing some major digital transformation project on the customer facing side where it increases revenue. Do you agree? I, I fully agree. And there are some more financial and perhaps non-financial bonuses from customer IEM, for instance, which are not in the uh, employee or privilege access management environments. So for customer environments, I know the case for a customer who has seven different portals, seven different customer portals. So converging is a big benefit to invest in new CIM platform to migrate all those different portals to one backend. It will definitely save money, uh, partly because there's some old technology left and some technical depth. So if, if you invest in new stuff, you can move ahead, you can be more scalable, uh, you can ditch all that old stuff which you don't want anymore. Um, second, <laughs> a semi perspective from CM for instance, if your competitor is investing in new on bells and whistles CM product, well we often see that the competitors is what drives the, our customer to do the same. So yeah, my competitor has got the new bezel bells and whistles CM product. I need it as well. Or so there's there's a different business case. It can not a, not really financial. It will not make a lot of money, except for perhaps you can save money by ditching all stuff. It will not give a profit, but it it will reduce, may be able to reduce costs in other domains. Yeah, I feel like sometimes um, intuitively a business may know it needs to do something like digital transformation, and identity is part of that, but still want to see you go through the exercise of making a business case that's compelling, that's going to grow the business. Or um, I think one of the things that you brought up earlier was manage risk. So manage or reduce the risk of something catastrophic happening to the business. Go through that exercise. We know we need to do it, but may, you know, go through that exercise of 
How is this going to help the business? Well, those risk humanities are uh, relevant. For instance, data breaches, there well, all over the place every day. And data breaches, of course, are, in my opinion, well, I may be overdoing it, but it's a mostly a wrongly executed access control. Too many people with too many authorizations. A hacker need not have authorization. Why do they get access? Because some other level access control is not well implemented. So um, I am, in that sense, it's really, really a basic continuity item. You need to have access control in a decent way to prevent accidents happening. So it's a risk reduction uh, process, risk reduction policy, you could say. So you have to identify those risks. It's all about, for instance, data breaches is, is relevant. Ransomware are the same. Why should any user have access to rights to a server when they don't need to write? So it's, it's all the same. Too many people have too many authorizations. And that's... Uh, uh, that is all kinds of rights. I've, I read another article in the Middle Village um, about privilege access management, and I showed a nice example about too many authorizations for too many people, um, which is a relevant issue. Uh, there was the issue of uh, some of the old presidents uh, posting tweets about, send me one Bitcoin and I'll send you two back. And as I explained in the article, privilege access management article, it's all due to the fact that some criminal found uh, the credentials to log into the management system of Twitter to make it possible to revoke authorizations and to post those messages. So it's a silly risk, but you have to manage it. So make sure that your authorizations are kept, are, are well kept, are maintained well, that they're only available to people who need those authorizations. And that's where identity access management is. It's, as I said, it's not very sexy. In a security sense, it's not a sexy profession, uh, which is why it's still more or less uh, hidden. Um, it's an um, yeah, invisible foundation uh, in governance. Um, but it's, it's, I think it, it is. I everything. think it's subtle sexy, Andre. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> the subtle sexy, yes. <laughs> You should write an article about that. <laughs> I, think, section, you know, still got, I, I, I think our second episode ever, I think I titled it something like getting into the sexy world of I am or something like that. <laughs> so I just, it sprang into my mind when you said that. I was like, all right, I think I remember like five years ago writing a show title like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I try to get people to understand that I am can be sexy. So we're talking about zero trust and policy-based access control and all, all that new modern stuff, which makes, really makes it sexy. So yeah. there, there's new developments that, that really help for uh, getting more into oh. phones. So that's the, uh, it will help. It will grow. <laughs> well, if we, if we didn't have to worry about DRM, I would play the uh, right said Fred, I'm too sexy for, and then, you know, fade out. So maybe that's what I'll do for this one. You talked oh, about it. risk and we talked about business case. And I think one of the most important things that comes out of this is the return on investment. Everyone always wants to know what am I getting for my money, my investment, my time allocation? Because it's not just money sometimes. It's, hey, we're going to invest people into this as well and their time. And so how do we talk about return on investment as part of this business case? I kind of want to break this down in a couple of ways, but maybe we start at the high level. And then you also mentioned earlier, you know, the difference between quantitative and qualitative or subjective benefits. Sure, there are things you'll be able to measure, right? But there's also things where I kind of mentioned before, it's like, it just feels good. We should be doing that. And maybe to some degree, that's kind of where you were going with, while well, our competitors are doing it, we've got to keep up or something along those lines. Maybe we can start with that kind of macro question of how do we talk about return on investment in a business case? Yeah, let me first explain return on investment as a, as a topic. It's an economical uh, meaning. It's at least... If you invest one million, uh, and uh, end of the year you, you got one mil, one really one hundred thousand in, in cash, the return is one hundred thousand. Meaning, if you cal- calculate it's a ten percent return on investment, so your profit will be one hundred thousand on the invested of a million. Meaning, it's ten percent in this year of your return on investment, your profits. And so that means that it, it uh, assumes that you can investigate, that you can calculate the investment. It will help. It shows it's going to calculate the return. And that if those two values are there, they can calculate the return on investment. That's, that's relatively simple. It's a simple model. It's an old model, economical model, and we can try to use it. 
But in IEM, there are few different issues that make it difficult to calculate return on investment. One of the um, things I wrote in the article makes this very difficult is to not just investing um, in uh, coming up with the investment sum. You you can calculate the investment. You get a proposal from a vendor. Say, well, you got one one million. You got to implement it and do some trading. So the total investment will be two million next year. That's that's quite easy. But then you have to, in fact, in fact, invest additional. Your employees have to get training, so they cannot work if they do training. You have some errors to respond to, to fix. You've got some other quality issues you have to fix. So it will not be million, two million, it's perhaps three million. So the investment sum itself is kind of difficult to calculate. But even more difficult to calculate is the return. And in, for instance, if you got the business and you sell widgets, for one million, and you you get to one hundred thousand as a return, so you make nice profit on widgets, selling widgets. That's nice, but in IEM you don't sell identities, you don't sell authorizations. So that means that you have to get your investment in a different way, mostly in the order of savings. So savings will, in fact, help you get a return on investment. So if you do something, if you have less to do, the less work is a is a Benefit is a is a you could say return on investment. So, for instance, if you can automate the join and move lever process, whereas normally it would take one hour to create an account, now you can automate that. You just have to calculate the number of accounts that are, have to be created or removed and times the the, the the hourly rate. Then you get the total sum of the cost that you can save if you automate. So that the, so that's that's not too difficult to calculate. But there's another issue. For instance, su- suppose um, you have a standard calculation for is password resets. It's the same issue. Password resets, it takes half an hour. And um, if you calculate enough as of password resets, you can, in fact, ditch your service desk because all password resets can be automated. But that never happens because if a service desk employee is not resetting a password, he's doing other stuff. Perhaps other stuff that, that needs to be on some, some backlog. So, in fact, it, you have a return on investment, but you cannot calculate it because there's no return. There's no, you cannot uh, fire any employee because the, the work's not lower there. People will do other things. So it's hard to calculate. So you have to effectively try to investigate what are the returns on the investments to make it possible to calculate the return on investment. So the, the real value in IEM is partly valuable. And in, in the article, there is a PDF in the article with a lot of tables in there, and there are some, some formulas. I tried to come up with some formulas about what is the investment, what the return on investments. You have to, well, I don't know how to call it in English, but it's uh, with, take it with a grain of salt, the, the formulas. So, um, so there are some formulas, for instance, the number of uh, joiners times the uh, not the time it costs to make an account and times time the rate of an employee doing it. It will give some idea about the cost savings of automating joint and mobile leave process. So your yeah. rough estimation. Andre, I think what you're talking about is the difference between hard hard dollar savings and soft dollar savings, right? So with soft dollar savings you are mostly getting those through efficiency, whereas hard dollar savings come from you know the idea of like letting people go. Or if you're in an outsource model, it might be easier to measure. I've always felt like that was something that, you know, if you're paying a dollar amount for password resets to an outside firm and you can actually reduce those numbers, you actually achieve savings. That's hard dollars. But if what you're talking about is using the help desk example that you mentioned, you are making the help desk more efficient, then that's soft dollars. It seems like executives are always willing to listen to hard dollar savings cases, and the bar is also much lower. But hard dollar savings are hard to achieve, especially when you're talking about reducing risk for the organization. I can hardly even think of an example where you reduce your security risk, reduce the risk of a data breach, reduce the risk that you're going to be on the front page of the New York Times 
uh, where you achieve hard savings by doing that. But you do achieve savings in terms of, wow, if that were to happen, you know, there is a dollar value to that. So I guess I'm throwing two issues at you at once. The first is hard dollars versus soft dollars, which I think you talked about. Um, the second is this idea of dollarizing non-savings type of um, benefits. So you'd have a benefit of enabling or, you know, making the organization more efficient or reducing risk. Is there a case, is there a time to try to turn that into, okay, we project a million dollars in savings and here's how we achieve that calculation? Or in your mind, is that just a waste of time? It's, it's not a real waste of time. It will not be a compelling um, argument to do the investment. It helps, enables investment decisions, perhaps. So you ha really have to try to come up with different saving categories. So like in the articles, I think some 50 or 80, I'm not sure I didn't calculate it, that's enough uh, arguments or um, motive, motives to do the investment. So you can use this, this article to come up with your own uh, evaluation of the of the case. So we have to if come up with the business case, identify the qualitative and the quantitative benefits, of course, of course, for this the topics. And it may not be valid for every organization, but it may help convince the, the the stakeholders who are decision makers. Um, and there are a lot of um, arguments to be made for investing in the hard dollar versus soft dollar. It does in fact help, um, although. Again, you have to take a game of salt. For instance, uh, one of the benefits will be risk reduction. For instance, if you've got a uh, supervisor agency or so, like the, the a banking environment or the, the European uh, legislation about GDPR, there's a total fine of 4% of the global revenue. That's the maximum fine, you could say. Yeah, that's nice, but that's not the risk. The risk is the, well, discovery of the is issue. And then the calculation, of, okay, we, we, we have discovered we made a mistake, so we are findable. Um, but what's, what's the real risk? What do we, we don't, we don't save the whole fine, the, the maximum. It shall not be the risk that we save. It will not be the saving. So there must be some, um, you know, you have to try to find out the real saving, the potential saving of this event. So it is hard to come up with this hard dollar as, um, calculation. So it's, it's, uh, it's not black and white, you could say, but it will help convince decision makers that they are less li uh, likely to be on the newest times front page because there's an incident. So less likely to have this event, less likely to be a target. Um, so all these uh, arguments may help convince decision makers to do an investment. At the risk of getting to like inception level, now I'm wondering... Do we need to do an ROI on the ROI? <laughs> How much time should I spend building right the the ROI for the business case? Um, and I'm curious, like, is there are there levels of okay? And maybe it's context. I'm talking to one person, and maybe it's hey, I think this is a good idea. What do you think? And maybe an executive says, yeah, why don't you go look at that a little bit more and come back to some high level numbers? And then maybe it's like okay, yeah, that seems like we're direction correct. Maybe now is the time to do like a full blown. ROI, like to get maybe project approval. Do you think that that's a viable method to kind of start? Because it seems almost daunting to say, oh my gosh, I have to now figure out the risk of maybe the discoverability of maybe us might might get a fine and then reputational damage, <laughs> right? What, how do you quantify that kind of stuff? You think that's a viable approach? No, it's, it's not a viable approach in my opinion. So there are the, the quantifiable components, you can try to come up with some kind of calculation. So, well, we can save a few hundred thousand euros, dollars per year because of automation. So efficiency, efficiency benefits, non-efficiency oriented benefits are hard to quantify. You could say we, we have some less reputation damage if something happens. What's the value of that? Well, I'm not sure. It depends on the reputation damage. Uh, same for the risk of fines or uh, um, end user Satisfaction. How do you calculate the end user satisfaction of automation? So it's, it's hard to come up with different uh, issues. There are some hard non quantifiable issues or some hard quali 
qualitative aspects versus audit findings. And if there's an audit finding, mostly it starts with the color yellow, then it's orange, and then red, and then, well, then it's too late. Um, you could say there's really a benefit of fixing audit findings. Too many admin accounts, okay, or too many authorizations in the financial system, okay. No segregation of duties, okay. These are, in fact, non-financial, but very strict findings that you have to fix. Otherwise, your uh, your accountant will come up with a negative uh, well, opinion about your going on. So there are some um, hard qualitative components that you can identify that you have to fix, and it will not bring any money. It will give you some uh, sustainability or organization, perhaps, but it will not make any money. Perhaps it will save money because you don't get a fine or you get some other... Um, well, I'm not sure about that, but you, you could, these are less... These are hard, but not quantifiable components. So it's a, if you say, well, is it a viable to come up with a calculation for an ROI? I say go for the quantifiable components that you can identify. So like in the article, where the formulas are added in the, in the article, there are some quantifiable components that you could identify. Um, but for the, for the rest, I'd say, yeah, alas, no financial business case. But there are so, so many other benefits. Hey, I've got a thought on this as well, which is, so when I was in business school, we learned how to do net present value calculations. And the example was, Boeing is building the 777. It's going to take 20 years to build, sell these planes, and then at the end, the, the, that plane is no longer, it reaches into flight, they're going to stop building them. And they have a lot of expenditures in the first five years, and then the income starts coming in, the revenue. And so the revenue gets discounted by year. It's a very complex calculation, right? To do that, to spend fifty thousand dollars on an enhancement to a privilege to to stand up a secrets vault that is absolutely crazy. But it also gets me thinking about two things. One is, I think certain organizations have a certain level of sophistication around doing return on investment calculations. Some organizations, and it's not even the organization, it probably has a lot to do with the size of the effort, but. In some cases, the size of the effort requires you to do a break-even analysis. So, okay, show us when we're going to get our money back. And that's what I was talking about earlier with Andre with, you know, trying to, um, you know, make, go, run through the case just so that you realize the value. What is the return? I'm going to spend $50,000 or $100,000. How is, how is that beneficial to the organization? I think the other scenario is where you want to spend multiple millions of dollars on something. And, and that's where I, I do, I still think it depends on, okay, what is the organization expecting to see? Just because you're spending $3 million doesn't mean you have to do net present value calculations, unless that's what your CFO or, you know, the ultimate decision maker on that investment is going to require. Um, um let me push back here for a second, though, because I think we're talking relative terms here. So for some organizations, $50,000 is a rounding error, a drop in the bucket, doesn't matter. For some, that is a lot of money. And so I think this is a little bit organizational size and maybe scope and kind of driven to say, look, we're going to spend $50,000 on this, and maybe we only have a budget of $100,000. you are saying you want to use half of my budget to do this thing? That's a very significant decision for that organization. But yeah. I'm with you. I think you have to kind of take this from an organizational approach and say, okay, what are the thresholds? How much rigor do we need to do to do return investment? And, and a lot of organizations that I've been a part of and seen and worked with is they have maybe certain levels. If we think the project is going to be $100,000 or more, it has to go through this process and these types of calculations need to be done. If it's less than that, you know, maybe there's less for it because... Again, they have a little, maybe a little more leeway <laughs> from a budgeting standpoint, but I don't want to forget about the small companies out there because I work with a lot of them. And, you know, for them, 50,000 might be their entire budget, maybe for security or for whatever maybe be. And we're talking, I think we're, it, we just got to make sure that uh, the, the ROI makes sense and you're doing, you know, the right calculations that are appropriate for the size of the organization. That's a great point. 
Uh, I did want to bring out one more point before I, I kind of stop, get off my soapbox, which is I think one of the biggest um, ROI use cases that we have is whether to insource something versus outsource something. So then it becomes kind of a head-to-head. Um, I think as much as possible, you want to make sure that you're comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges. So we outsource and we get some not so good service or potentially we insource and we get not so good service. But what I've seen a lot of times is people outsource and they're not getting what they want and they make the decision, okay, we want to insource. How do you make that case to the business? It's usually we can do it for the same budget and get a much better greater service, or we can even do it for less than what we're paying now and get a much better service, things like that. So I wanted to get, Andre, are you seeing that a lot in that, you know, head-to-head comparison? Yeah, I mean, trying to look at that, uh, first, possibly because our customers want it. If they want to for IGA environment, their discussion is, do we insource or outsource? But there's another um, non Business case related issue about that is scarcity of people, for instance, scarcity of knowledge. So that, that often brings additional dynamics to the, dis- to the discussion. Uh, at this moment, we see scarcity. So outsourcing is more logical for a lot of company, companies without looking at the cost as themselves because they don't have the resources available to manage their own environment or they don't have the knowledge to do role modeling or having a secret management in place because they don't have the knowledge. I see the smaller companies, of course, that's, that's, that's also, it looks like it's a no-brainer to go to, to SaaS environments, for instance, to have to IGA in the cloud, even PAM in the cloud. It looks like that's the new way of the new normal. Uh, for the bigger companies, they have resources, but it's still, I am, as a profession, is still relatively small, non-sexy, per se, non-visible, but it's... Scarcity of employees, scarcity of resources, that's more pressing than the business case as such. So, so far, we didn't do a, we do it, it was, was or twice a B comparison between insourcing and outsourcing. And then the financial issue wasn't the same. It wasn't the, the, the trigger to make a decision, mostly in sustainability and having resources available, knowledge experience to do it. So, uh, it's a good question, Jim, because this is relevant. People try to think, well, we make an investment based on ROI or based on financial uh, information, but there are other dynamics playing around having an, having an impact on the decision making. It can also be like culture. Um, we try to do everything ourselves. So we want to do it ourselves or we don't want to do it ourselves. It's another non-financial driver that that uh, well makes or breaks decisions so it's uh, uh even though the business case is relevant every customer wants a business case every customer of our customers is looking for what does it cost what does it bring and we have to uh, manage it back to what does it bring in the broad sense not just the financial sense so the financial business case it helps mostly because it can help you Make a planning for your investment. When do I have to invest? What? So, plateau one, plateau two, or sprint one, two, three, when are they coming? So, you can prepare for the expenditures, the costs. Uh, but it doesn't um, make the decision about investing or not investing. The other uh, parts, the qualify, quantify, qualitative components are more important. And they should be more important because it's a business question and IT. Well, it's more focused on resource financial. We need to have business case to do to buy new laptops versus. Um, well, that's a technical debt issue, perhaps. But for the business end, you need to have the money available to to see the value of investing in IEM, whether it's uh, IGA or it's private access management or it's consumer identity access management or zero trust. The business should see the value of it. And part of the value is financial. But a lot, a bigger part of the value is non-financial, in my opinion. So we talk about uh, really kind of a bunch of quantitative and qualitative, right? There's hard investment, dollar saved. There is um, uh, soft benefits like user experience or compliance, right? Or enabling the business, right? Whatever you want to take from those. Um, I mentioned early on that we had just done a show about setting up an IM program. And we had a question from one of our superior listeners, uh, Chris Power. 
he asked about the best metrics to track in order to prove your ROI case. Are there, so, so let me ask that explicitly, right? What are the best metrics to track in order to prove ROI? Are there like, you should, your ROI should always have these one, two, or three numbers. Is there any guidance like that? I would say uh, to ROI, if you're looking for a traditional ROI, it should have at least all these components that you can identify. What are the savings? We know the costs. What co what saving components can we identify? Can we, because of automation, get some more efficiency benefits? Or that's, that's a com concrete uh, ROI case. You could say that's, a, uh, that's one of the parameters that you need to identify. So this, the efficiency benefits should be calculated in the ROI. These are, there are metrics for that. You could say in the article, I show some formulas. As I said, take with a grain of salt, but these are formulas that end up in result in a number. And those numbers should be calculated. It will not say that there's a, I, I don't have a industry-wide KPI for ROI investments. I don't have that. I'm not sure if that's, that's, there is available. There's one of those KPIs available. Perhaps you should come up with those metrics. Perhaps in the body knowledge, we can create some documented metrics for IAM investments. But at least you should identify the different elements of the ROI calculation. So try to find all identify all cost savings and all costs. That's relevant. And in the article, I, I wrote about some 10 different cost saving elements with the calculation. You should identify all of those for your organization. And as you mentioned before, Jeff, you said this is a small organization, big organization. Yeah, that's that that's a big difference. Um uh, one of the fun topics I found out in a long time ago was um in the banking sector, they have some regulations. Like in Europe, you got the uh, um, Basel IV and the Solvency regulation. I believe the US has something similar. And those uh, metrics, they just, those calculations have metrics about what are, should your reserve as a bank be? How much is your reserve, your, your debt money? How much debt money do you need for bad risks? If you don't know your risks, you need to have a lot of debt money, which is not not relevant. You can't use that. If you can you reduce your risk, you get less debt money. That money can be used elsewhere. So if you can reduce your risk, you can have more money available for doing business. And I think identity access management can reduce the risk of too many authorizations, wrong authorizations, uh, wrong identification of authorizations, so identification. So you can reduce the effective right risk, thereby reducing the or banks, for instance, the, the reserve capital requirements and make it possible for them to get more money. So by saving, by investing in IEM, you can get a multiple way of additional investment benefits because you don't have to have that, that money. And there's a multiplier of one or 10 or whatever. So 1 million Capital can be used for 10 million investments elsewhere, perhaps. I'm not sure about those calculations. But, so these are also uh, capabilities that you could, should identify for your branch, your industry. And so there's, I'm not sure there's an, an industry-wide KPIs or um, success ratios or whatever. But we, these, we should identify all those costs and all those benefits, the financial ones, to come up with anything that you can call it IRA, IRA, but... I'm not sure if we can say 10% or 20% or 100% ROI should be calculated. So, uh, Andre, I think that, I mean, even if your project is going to return 500% ROI, right? It seems like, oh, that's an obvious one. We should throw money at it. I feel like if you don't get the right buy-in, the right support organizationally, it's doomed to fail. And I, I feel like there's a communication component to getting buy-in. So can you talk a little bit about that? What's What are some best practices for communicating and getting buy-in for your project and your return on investment or your business case, I should say? Yes. Interesting that the business case comes up in this topic because it's the most essential for starting any IEM projects like you discussed in the previous uh, podcast. Try to start a project 
there are different ways why you should start a project. And some of them are from IT department, like for instance, more efficiency or whatever. So, and they should have a way to communicate that and need to the business because you need the funding for an investment in the IT project. So that means that we have to follow the normal communication lines in any organization. So IT should speak to a CTO, CTO should speak to the CEO. So to make it possible to get at least the awareness at the C level where it's where the money comes from. If the business case is start, if the IM project started from, for instance, a compliance issue, this compliance officer the, should talk with the chief risk officer, for instance, and they should speak with the C, chief executive officers to make sure that there's awareness about what we should need to do. That brings the money. So don't try to directly communicate with uh, one of the stakeholders who has the money. Try to find the normal ways of communication. Try to find the relevant stakeholders that you can influence because you cannot influence what beyond your control. So I wrote another article about uh, strategic alignments and actually governance. And there are showed some models that you can use for that to and that, and that help perhaps find the, communi- the ways of communication between business and IT. That's, that's the relevant part. So even if IT thinks we're never making a business case, they need to convince the business that this is the business case, that the business needs it. So communication is key. And so if you want to start an IM project or program, Try to find out what's the driver, what's the most important driver for that? Is it efficiency, is it compliance or a data breach or whatever? What's the what's the issue? Perhaps competitors are doing it, so that can be another issue. I know for a fact that a long time ago, uh, a lot of IJ tools were sold on the on the golf course because, well, the one CEO and another CEO were doing the golf course playing golf and discussing their own investments. So you try to find the, the right drivers for in, the investments in IAM and then try to find... How can you influence the, the correct stakeholders? Find the right way of communication. Don't go directly. That doesn't work. So I'm going to take that. Uh, I know you wrote that other article. It's called Strategic Alignment and Access Governance. So I'll put a link to that in our show as well. It's, it's probably a good companion document <laughs> right, to read along with the business case one. Um, look, I want you to get on with your evening. And I'm appreciative of your time spent with us and kind of explain this. And, and I think it was very helpful to talk through this because this is super important for folks to really understand. They've got to be able to articulate this. They've got to be able to at least figure out some way to communicate the value of the project, typically, you know, or the investment, I should say, typically a return on investment calculation, or even if it's just, hey, here's what we know, and here are maybe some unknowns, and maybe here are some soft benefits, and maybe there's a confidence level that we could apply to say, hey, we're pretty sure about this number. And maybe the further away you get from that point, you know, there's a less confidence curve, right? But I think that being, being able to kind of articulate all that and pull it together helps show you've done the homework and, it, you know, whether it makes sense or not is really going to be up to whoever's going to cut you the check, <laughs> right, right, for that spend. Yeah. And like you said before, it's it's all in a creating awareness, communication, creating awareness that we need this. And it's not just a, a hobby project for one of the project managers or whatever. It's, it's, it's really... A, benefits the business that's why we need the business case to show that the business needs it in whatever way so i agree and jeff i i think just to emphasize the last point that andre was talking about with the stakeholders i mean if you're going to go in there and say our identity project helps enable these revenue growth you better have somebody who's on the revenue side of the house who is saying yeah those are real numbers i i agree with that because if you come out of information security and talk about how you're going to grow revenue. Uh, that's a, not a good place to be without that backup. Yeah. Why is my CISO trying to figure out revenue? <laughs> I want them focused on risk reduction and, you know, other security related items. Um, all right. We like to end shows on a lighter note. Andre, we were talking before we hit record about different languages and you speak multiple languages. I can barely speak one. Jim probably can speak it a little bit better than I can. But talk to me about, first of all, what are the languages that you speak and what are some of the differences maybe that you've kind of noticed to say, okay, in English, we do it this way and in Dutch, maybe do another or maybe other things like that. Like, what are some of your observations? Lots of observations. I have speak a number of languages, Dutch, of course, English, a little French, German, 
No. I did a good as it, as, at least as a tourist, I can make myself hurt. Um, some Latin. I had Latin on my high school a long time ago. My wife is from Friesland, so I speak, uh, I, l- I know, understand Friesian. I don't speak it, just a few words. So, quite a number of languages. And um, it, it's uh, the, the fun part is that Dutch and English are quite alike um, because of the history. A long time ago, we got all those uh, English speaking and Dutch speaking sailors traveling the world. So, we got a lot of words in common. But the English language is really a silly language. So it's a lot of That's not really letters you don't speak and where you, you write them and don't speak. We got the same in Dutch, for actual, I'm not sure. But um, what's, what's, um, I, I think this difference is perhaps not just in the language within the people speaking the language. There was just this case this week, last week, about um, our Formula One driver, Max Verstappen. Um, he got the fines by the yeah, because he said a four letter word that deemed well not not nice in some English speaking languages. Whereas in, in Dutch language, we just use that English word all of the time without it doesn't mean anything. Just we say, "Well, it's uh, it didn't work out right, not as expected." So that's the meaning of the word. But if you, if you don't understand how we use the word and how other people use the word, the same word may end up being a uh, how you say it? Uh, deal breaker. <laughs> and uh, so it's it's relevant that we understand uh, not just the speak of the word, also the context where it's spoken in. And so context is key in uh, any discussion. And so it's uh, interesting to see that uh, well, it looks simple, simple, but it's very complex. Even if you can translate, translation doesn't bring the context and doesn't give the real meaning. So. Um, speaking all those languages, it's sometimes it's difficult to find the right words. <laughs> That's kind of understood. funny because yeah, you never know if you're. I might be saying something in English that might be a swear word, <laughs> right? In yeah. another language, or vice versa, right? Is maybe you're saying something that's like, oh, that sounds pleasant, and maybe it's not so pleasant. <laughs> we, we, we use your words all the time for swearing. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, you so earlier you came you you mentioned and I guess it's I don't know if it's an English phrase but like grain of sand, right? What would be the Dutch equivalent or maybe another language equivalent of that idea of a grain of sand in that context? A great, yeah, grain of salt, grain of sand. Yeah. Um, or a grain of salt. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> See, I'm I'm sure. I've got it wrong. I told you I could barely yeah, speak that, one that, language. But I think I mean, there, there, even in Dutch, there are multiple ways of saying the same, having the same saying on the same, same, same words. Um, it's hard to find it. I took, right now, I can't call it with them. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a, uh, um, yeah. We, we also say, we can say something like putting salt on a snail. So, putting yeah, salt on a put, snail. That, that's not good yeah. for the snail. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't look so. No, but it's all. Uh, we got some other words that I cannot pronounce, but it's all about putting too much de- things on detail, all, not on one thing. So, um, like, aren't uh, wise and any, any wise pound foolish is also <laughs> the same. So, making. Small things important, whereas other things are more important that are neglected. So, it's um, so the same form. As it relates to those calculations. Well, take those the results with a grain of salt. It, it's a result, but don't make it value too valuable. Mm-hmm. Don't put too much value on the outcome of the calculations. It's, it may help, but don't don't make it too important. So, put the things in perspective. Jim, what are you going to sa- have your thoughts on this? I'm sure because you you've been to the Netherlands and you've re- tried to read some of those road signs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've, I've tried to read some of the signs on the side of the road, and it's a lot of consonants shrunk together. Uh, so sometimes I'm not sure how to say the words. But one thing I found, well, almost everybody in Holland speaks some English or speaks very good English. Um, and that's throughout the country. So I stayed in a town called Leiden. For the most part, I visited Amsterdam. I visited the Nord Z. And, and there are a lot of words like that. Like I say Nord Z, almost any English speaker can figure out that what I'm saying is the North Sea, right? And there are other words like um, the word for soup is S-O-E-P. So you look at a menu. Like I, Obviously, I think one of the first things you do is you start to learn food words 
S O E P was soup. Okay. I like soup. Pri- you got to have your priorities, man. <laughs> you have to have your priorities. Panakukins. Those were pancakes. And like, you know, again, it's like, it was surprising how much like English the Dutch language was. Now, when was I able to hold a conversation in Dutch? Heck no. But I could look at a menu and figure out what I wanted and order it. And uh, that's important. This is where I pull out Google Translate on my phone and like take a picture and like, okay, thank you, technology. Because <laughs> yeah, I would Jim. be a very hungry boy. <laughs> you can bring Jim. <laughs> there you go. He's he's my Google Translate if I ever go somewhere. Yeah, there you go. We might get lucky, but we might get pancake soup. <laughs> <laughs> but that reminds me, of course, in the, in the body knowledge, um, I try to write English. But if you see the articles in body knowledge, they're not what I written. We got some good editors, uh, um, yeah. Heather. like uh, Heather and Elizabeth, and thanks to those people, the articles are good to read. Otherwise, you would read my. Yeah. English, which is not not readable for you guys. So, uh, so all praise goes to those editors. I'm happy with those. Otherwise, uh, it would be my hobby work, and you wouldn't understand what I would mean. And you can't even just take like the article and like paste it into Google Translate because the context, right, is not there. And sometimes nope. the, the translation is just doing word by word by word versus let me scan the entire document and try to infer context. Maybe AI makes that better. I mean, we're seeing improvements there, but who knows. Uh, yeah. So we'll see. But thank you for writing the article. I think it's been very helpful. Again, I'll have a link in our show notes for both of the articles uh, that you wrote. There was uh, the business case for IEM and then the strategic alignment and access governance document that goes really well with that. So, And we'll also have a link to you in our show notes. So people have questions, want to reach out. Uh, it looks like it's K-O-O-T in English. I pronounce it as Koot. It is Andre Coat. <laughs> so there we go. Another language thing. Uh, but I'll have a link to your LinkedIn profile so people can can reach out if they've got questions. And yeah, thank you so much for taking time with us today. We'll let you get on with your your evening and uh, enjoy the rest of it. As far as Jim and I are concerned, we're on the web, idacpodcast.com, uh, X and Twitter or whatever you want to call it, at IDAC Podcast. Uh, the YouTube channel still going, idacpodcast.tv. And then, yeah, connect with us on LinkedIn, send us comments. Uh, great question again from Chris Power, really kind of getting into the show and, and helping us out with hey, what are the things that people want to hear? Let us know so we can ask our guests or we can find a guest that maybe can kind of talk uh, with more authority on that subject. So it's very helpful for us. So with that, we'll go ahead and leave it for this week. Thank you everybody for watching and or listening. And we'll talk with you all in the next one. You've been listening to Identity at the Center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com. See you next time on Identity at the Center.